The Art of Living Consciously The Power of Awareness to Transform Everyday Life By Nathaniel Brandon Part 4 The Old Male and the Old Female Unfortunately, most of us have not yet learned how to allow our male and female energies to function naturally, in the proper relationship with each other. In our patriarchal culture, we have used our male energy, our ability to think and act, to suppress and control our feminine intuition, rather than to support and express her. I call this traditional use of the male energy the old male, and it exists equally in men and women, although it is often more obvious and external in men, more subtle and internal in women. The old male is that part of us that wants to keep control. He is terrified of our feminine power because he doesn't want to surrender to the power of the universe. He is afraid that if he surrenders, he will lose his individual identity. He holds on to individuality and separateness at any cost. Therefore, he denies the power of the feminine, which is a force moving toward union and oneness. In relationship with the old male, the female is helpless in the world. Her power cannot move directly into the physical world without the support of the male's action. Her power is suppressed, and must come out indirectly through manipulative patterns or physical illnesses, or in sudden, unfocused ways, such as emotional outbursts. You can see that men and women have played out these roles externally. In the traditional male role, men are taught to deny and suppress their inner female, to be machine-like, unemotional, totally in control, and suppressive toward women, secretly, they may be terrified of women because women remind them of the power of their inner feminine side, which they are busy denying. Because they are cut off from their internal power source, they really feel very alone and lost. In the traditional female role a woman also learns to use her male energy to deny and suppress her feminine power. This leaves her helpless, dependent on men, and able to express her power only indirectly, through manipulation. She may be afraid that if men found out how powerful she is, they would abandon her, so she carefully keeps her power hidden, perhaps even from herself. It's important to realize that both the old male and the old female exist in each sex. A woman who is expressing herself in the traditional way described above has a controlling, macho, old male inside her, suppressing her. She will tend to attract men who mirror this male personality and will act it out in their behavior toward her. This behavior may range from paternalistic and chauvinistic to verbally and physically abusive, depending on how the woman treats herself and what she believes she deserves. Once she begins to trust and love herself more and starts to use her internal male energy to support herself, the behavior of the men in her life will reflect that shift. They will either change dramatically and continue to change as she does, or they will disappear from her life, to be replaced by men who are supportive and appreciative of her, who will mirror her new attitude toward herself. I've seen this happen many times. The traditional macho man has a helpless female voice inside of him desperately trying to be heard. He will tend to attract women who have a low self-image and are clingy and needy, or who express their power indirectly through manipulation, little girl cuteness, sexual seductiveness, cattiness, or dishonesty. These women reflect his lack of trust and respect for his inner female by not trusting and respecting themselves. By opening to, and trusting, his own feminine nature, he'll find within himself the nurturing, support, and connection he's been lacking. The women in his life will mirror this shift by becoming stronger, more independent, more direct and honest, and more genuinely loving and nurturing. T. He new male and the new female the feminine power, the power of the spirit, is always within us. It is up to our male energy to determine how we relate to that power. We can either fight it, block it, attempt to control it, and try to keep ourselves separate from it, or we can surrender and open to it, learn to support it, and move with it. Individually and collectively, we are shifting from a position of fear and control into surrender and trust of the intuitive. The power of the feminine energy is on the rise in our world. As she emerges within us and we acknowledge and surrender to her, the old male within us is transformed. He re-emerges, birthed through the female, as the new male, 
the one who goes all out in his trust and love for her. He must grow to become her equal in power so that they can be the partners they are meant to be. I believe that the new male has been truly birthed in our consciousness only within the last few years. Before that, we had little experience in our bodies of the true male energy. Our only concept of male was the old patriarchal male, an energy divorced from the feminine. The birth of the new male is synonymous with the birth of the new age. The new world is being built within us and mirrored around us as the new male, physical form, emerges in all his glory from the feminine power, spirit. An image. Every now and then I do a visualization process in which I ask for an image of my male and female. Each time I do it, I receive something a little different that teaches me something new. I'm sharing with you one of the most powerful images, because it is such a dramatic illustration of one aspect of the relationship between inner female and male. My female energy appeared as a beautiful, radiant queen, overflowing with love and light. She was being carried through the streets on a litter borne by several carriers. The people were lining the streets, waiting for an opportunity to see her. She was so beautiful, open, and loving that as she passed by, waving, smiling, and throwing kisses to people, they were instantly healed of any pain or limitation. By her side walked a samurai warrior carrying a sword. This was my male energy. It was well understood by everyone that if anyone made a threatening move toward the queen, he would instantly raise his sword and ruthlessly cut down the offender. Knowing this, naturally, no one dared to harm her. He was willing to be absolutely unhesitating in his trust of his own judgment and his own response, which left her completely safe and protected. Feeling totally safe, having no need to hide or defend herself, she was free to be completely open, soft, and loving and to give her gifts freely and generously to all around her. Meditation Sit or lie down in a comfortable position and close your eyes. Take a few deep breaths and relax your body and mind complete, L.Y. Allow your conscious awareness to move into a quiet place with, in you. Now bring to your mind an image that represents your inner female. This image could be an actual person, an animal, or it could be something more abstract, an energy, a color or shape, or simply a feeling. Spontaneously take whatever comes to you. Take a look at your female and get a sense or a feeling of what she represents to you. Notice some of the details of the image. Notice the colors and textures. Notice how you feel about her. Ask her if she has anything she would like to say to you right now. Allow yourself to receive her communication, which may or may not be in words. You may also ask her any questions you have. There may be something you want to know from her. Again, receive her communication to you, whether it comes in words, a feeling, or an image. Once you have allowed yourself to receive her communication, and you feel complete for this moment, take a deep breath and release her image from your mind. Come back to a quiet, still place. Now draw to mind an image that represents your male self. Again, take what image comes to you. It could be an image of an actual man or it could be some abstract symbol or color. Explore this image. Begin to notice the details of it. Notice its colors and texture. Notice how you feel about him. Then, ask him if he has anything to communicate to you at this time. Be receptive to receiving his communication, whether it is in words or some other form. If you have anything you want to ask him, do this now. Be open to any words or images you may receive. If an answer doesn't come to you immediately, know that it will come later. Once you feel complete with your communication with him, release his image from your mind. Come again to a quiet place inside. Now, ask for the images of both your male and female to come to you at the same time. See how they relate to one another. Are they in relationship to one another or are they separate? If they are in relationship to one another, how do they relate? Ask them if they have anything they would like to communicate to one another or to you. Stay open to what comes to you in words, 
images, or feelings. If you have anything you'd like to say to them or ask them, do that now. When you feel complete, once again take a deep breath and release their images from your mind. Come back to a quiet, still place inside. Exercise. Close your eyes and contact your female intuitive voice. Ask her what she wants, is there a gift she desires or something she wants to say or do? When she has told you what she wants, imagine your new male supporting her desire. See him taking whatever necessary action to honor her need and desire. When you open your eyes, do your best to follow whatever you feel your intuition wants you to do. Chapter 9 Men and Women we all instinctively understand the basic functions of feminine and masculine energies, but we may not realize that they both exist in each person. More often we tend to associate male and female energies with their respective body types. Thus, women have become the symbols of female energy. Traditionally, women have developed and expressed receptivity, nurturing, intuition, sensitivity, and emotion. In the past, many women more or less repressed assertiveness, direct action, intellect, and the ability to function effectively and strongly in the world. Likewise, men have become the symbols of male energy. Traditionally, they have developed their ability to act in the world strongly, directly, assertively, and aggressively. Many men repressed and denied their intuition, emotional feelings, sensitivity, and nurturing. As we cannot live in the world without the full range of masculine and feminine energies, each sex has been helplessly dependent on the other half for its survival. From this perspective, each person is only half a person, dependent on their other half for its very existence. Men have desperately needed women to provide them with the nurturing, intuitive wisdom, and emotional support without which they unconsciously know they would die. Women have been dependent on men to take care of them and provide for them in the physical world, where they haven't known how to take care of themselves. It might seem like a perfectly workable arrangement, men help women, women help men, except for one underlying problem, as an individual, if you don't feel whole, if you feel your survival depends on another person, you are constantly afraid of losing them. What if that person dies or goes away? Then you die, too, unless you can find another such person who is willing to take care of you. Of course, something might happen to that person also. Thus, life becomes a constant state of fear in which the other person is merely an object for you, your supply of love or protection. You must control that source at any cost, either directly, by force or superior strength, or indirectly using various manipulations. Generally, this happens subtly, I'll give you what you need so you will be just as dependent on me as I am on you, so you will keep giving me what I need. So our relationships have been based on dependency and the need to control the other person. Inevitably, this leads to resentment and anger, most of which we repress because it would be too dangerous to express it and risk losing the other person. The repressing of all these feelings leads to dullness and deadness. This is one reason why so many relationships start off exciting, wow. I think I've found someone who can really fulfill my needs, and end up either filled with anger or relatively dull and boring, they aren't fulfilling my needs nearly as well as I had hoped, and I've lost my own identity in the process, but I'm afraid to let go for fear I'll die without this person. Finding the Balance In recent times, of course, the strongly separated roles of men and women have begun to shift. In the last two generations, increasing numbers of women are exploring and expressing their abilities to act in the world. At the same time, a growing number of men have been looking within themselves and learning to open to their feelings and intuition. I believe this is happening because we have reached a dead-end street with our old world relationships and externalized concepts of masculine and feminine. The old models and ways of doing things are too limiting for us now, and we have not yet evolved effective patterns to take their place. It's a period of chaos and confusion, pain and insecurity, but also of tremendous growth. We are making a leap into the new world. I believe that every form of relationship, 
from the most traditional marriage to homosexual or bisexual relationships, represents each person's attempt to find their feminine-slash-masculine balance within. Women have traditionally been in touch with their female energy but they haven't backed her up with their male energy. They have not acknowledged what they know inside. They have always acted as if they were powerless when they are really very powerful. They have gone after external validation, from men especially, rather than internally validating themselves for what they know and who they are. Many women, like myself, have had strongly developed male energy but have used it in the old male way. I was very intellectual, very active, and drove myself very hard to shoulder the responsibilities of the world. I also had a very strongly developed female, but I didn't put her in charge. In fact, I ignored her a lot of the time. I basically protected my sensitive, vulnerable feelings by erecting a tough outer shell. I've had to learn to take that powerful male energy and use it to listen to, trust, and support my female. This allows her the safe, tie and support to emerge fully. I feel and appear softer, more receptive, and more vulnerable, but I am really much stronger than before. Women are now learning to back themselves up and validate themselves, instead of abandoning the responsibility in trying to get a man to do it for them. However, it's a deep-seated pattern that has endured for centuries, and it takes time to change it in the deepest layers. The key is to just keep listening to, trusting, and acting on our deepest feelings. The qualities that women have looked for in men, strength, power, responsibility, caring, excitement, romance, must be developed inside of ourselves. A simple formula is this, just treat yourself exactly the way you would want to be treated by a man. The interesting thing is that what we create within us is always mirrored outside of us. This is the law of the universe. When you have built an inner male who supports and loves you, there will always be a man, or even many men, in your life who will reflect this. When you truly give up trying to get something outside yourself, you end up having what you always wanted. For men, of course, the principle is exactly the same. Men are, traditionally, disconnected from their female energy, thereby disconnected from life, power, and love. They've been out there in the world secretly feeling helpless, alone, and empty, although they pretend to be in control and powerful. War is a good example of the old male energy lacking the wisdom and direction of the female. Men seek nurturing and internal connection through women but once they have connected with their own inner female, they will receive her incredible love from within themselves. For men, all the qualities you've wanted from a woman, the nurturing, softness, warmth, strength, sexuality, and beauty, already exist in your inner female. You will feel this when you learn to listen to your inner feelings and support them. You need to totally respect and honor your inner female energy by acting on your feelings for her. Then, every woman, every person, in your life will mirror that integration. They will have the qualities you've always wanted, and they will also receive love, warmth, nurturing, and strength from you. Many men, especially in recent times, have chosen to connect deeply with their feminine energy and, in doing so, have disconnected from their male. They've rejected the old macho image and have no other concept of male energy to relate to. These men are usually so afraid of their male energy, fearing that it will burst forth with all the old mindlessness and violence they equate with maleness, that they reject the positive, assertive male qualities as well. I feel it's very important for these men to embrace the concept of the new male, one who allows his spontaneous, active, aggressive male energy to flow freely, knowing that the power of his feminine is in charge, wisely directing him. This requires a deep trust that the inner female knows what she's doing and won't allow anything destructive or harmful to happen. New World Relationships a new idea of relationships is emerging that is based on each person developing wholeness within him or herself. Internally, each person is moving toward becoming a fully balanced feminine-slash-masculine being with a wide range of expression, from softest receptivity to strongest action. 
Externally, most people's style of expression will certainly be determined strongly by which type of body they are in, male or female. When people hear these ideas they sometimes express the fear that we will all become outwardly androgynous, men and women all appearing pretty much the same. The reverse is actually true. The more women develop and trust their male aspect to sup, port them and back them up internally, the safer they feel to allow their soft, receptive, beautiful feminine aspect to open up. The women I know who are going through this process, myself included, seem to become more feminine and beautiful even while they are strengthening their masculine qualities. Men who are surrendering and opening fully to their female energy are actually reconnected with the inner feminine power which enhances and strengthens their masculine qualities. Far from becoming effeminate, the men I know who are involved in this process become more secure in their maleness. In the new world, when a man is attracted to a woman, he recognizes her as a mirror of his feminine aspect. Through her reflection he can learn more about his own female side and move through whatever fears and barriers he may have to come to a deeper integration within himself. When a woman falls in love with a man, she is seeing her own male reflected in him. In her interactions with him she can learn to strengthen and trust her masculine side. If you know on a deep level that the person you're attracted to is a mirror of yourself, you cannot be overly dependent on him or her because you know that everything you see in your partner is also in you. You recognize that one of the main reasons you're in the relationship is to learn about yourself and deepen your connection with the universe. So, healthy relationships are based on the passion and excitement of sharing the journey into becoming a whole person. This might sound like we are evolving to a place where we are so whole within ourselves that we no longer need relationships at all. The paradox is this, as human beings, we are social, interdependent creatures. We do need one another. Part of experiencing wholeness is accepting the parts of us that need love, closeness, and intimacy with one another. So, creating conscious relationships involves honoring both our dependence and our interdependence. Gay Relationships My own experience in relationships is heterosexual, so I can hardly consider myself much of an expert on gay relationships. However, from talking and working with quite a few gay and lesbian friends and clients, I do have a strong sense that on a spiritual level, homosexual and bisexual relationships are a powerful step that some beings take to break through old, rigid roles and stereotypes to find their own truth. For some people, being in a close, Intense relationship with a person or persons of the same sex is the most powerful mirroring process they can find. Two women, for example, often seem to find a depth of connection with each other that they don't find with a man. They use this intuitive feminine connection to create a strong foundation and safe environment for each of them to practice building their internal male. They totally reflect and support each other in becoming whole and balanced. A man sometimes seems to find a matching male intensity with another man, an ability to go all out that he wouldn't find with a woman. He may also find in another man a support for moving into and exploring his feminine self without feeling he has to fulfill the old, stereotyped male role. I think many of these things are mysteries that we will understand only in retrospect. I believe that every being chooses the life path and relationships that will help him or her to grow the fastest. As we continue to evolve, I believe we will gradually stop categorizing ourselves and our relationships with any particular label such as gay, straight, and so on. I foresee a time when each person can be a unique entity with his or her free-flowing style of expression. Each relationship will be a unique connection between two beings, taking its individual form and expression. No categories are possible because each one is so different and follows its own flow of energy. Exercise Think of some of the most important women in your life. What are their strongest or most attractive qualities? Be aware that they mirror some aspects of your own female energy, whether you are a woman or a man. Now think of some of the most important men in your life. What qualities do you most like, admire, or appreciate about them?
recognize that they reflect similar aspects of your own male energy, again, this applies to you whether you're a man or a woman. If you have trouble seeing that some of the things you admire in others are in you as well, it may be because you have not yet developed those qualities in yourself as strongly as they have. In this case, try the following meditation. Meditation. Get in a comfortable position. Close your eyes, relax, take a few deep, slow breaths and move your consciousness into a deep, quiet place inside. Bring to mind one person whom you admire or are attracted to. Ask yourself what qualities you find most attractive in this perked son. Do you see those same qualities in yourself? If not, try imagining that you possess those same qualities. Imagine how you would look, talk, and act. Picture yourself in a variety of situations and interactions. If you feel these are qualities you want to further develop within yourself, continue to do this visualization regularly for a while. Chapter 10 East and West, a new challenge I have a strong feeling that in my last life I was a spiritual ascetic, perhaps in India, and probably living in meditation on a mountaintop somewhere. That way of life has a comfortable familiarity to it, and there is a longing somewhere within me to continue to live in that blissful simplicity. However, I know that this time I have chosen to take it to the next level, to integrate the spiritual, mental, emotional, and physical aspects of my being and learn to live in balance in the world. It is interesting to look at the world from the perspective of male and female, or spirit and form, in doing so I have discovered some fascinating things. In a sense, the East can be seen to represent the feminine polarity. Many of the Eastern cultures have an ancient and powerful spiritual tradition. Until recently, their strength and development have been primarily in the intuitive and spiritual realms, at least in comparison with the Western world. They have lacked development in the physical realm and, as a result, they have experienced a great deal of poverty, chaos, and confusion. The energy in the West, Europe and the United States, is more masculine. In modern history it has focused primarily on developing the physical realm while paying little attention to spiritual development. As a result, we have made incredible technological progress but we are experiencing a terrible poverty of spirit, a feeling of disconnection from our source. These two worlds are drawn to one another just as men and women are, with a certain amount of fear and distrust, but an overwhelming attraction nonetheless. Eastern spiritual teachings are flooding the West, and Western technology is gravitating toward the East. We are each hungry for what the other has. One of my favorite mental pictures of my travels in India is this, I was standing in a bazaar. In front of me were two booths. One booth had beautiful traditional handcrafted items for sale. A group of Europeans and Americans were crowded around it, eagerly bargaining for the lovely treasures. The other booth proudly displayed a variety of plastic items, bowls, kitchen utensils, even plastic shoes. A long line of Indians patiently waited their turn to purchase these precious things. Naturally, neither one of the groups cast even a second glance at the other booth. East and West can learn from each other, but like women and men, they must ultimately find within themselves that which they admire in each other. Hopefully, the developing third world countries will learn from our mistakes and develop a technology that is more harmoniously attuned to the spirit and the environment. And we in the West must develop a spiritual path that helps us to deal with the physical world. The Eastern spiritual traditions, and our Western spiritual traditions, as well, for that matter, are based on removing oneself as much as possible from the world in order to connect more deeply with the spirit. The world, with its temptations and distractions, is a very difficult place to maintain a focus on, and commitment to, inner truth. Thus, most serious traditional spiritual paths have involved some degree of renunciation of the world, relationships, money, material possessions, pleasures, and luxuries have been given up. The ideal has been to withdraw to a monastery or mountaintop and pursue a life of quiet contemplation, giving up all attachment to the world. 
Even those who choose to remain householders with families and jobs have usually followed strong rules and restrictions that are designed to keep them as separate from the world as possible. This contemplative spiritual orientation has been a necessary and powerful step, but it is reflective of the split we have maintained between spirit and form, between the female and male within us. To be a spiritual seeker, we have had to leave the physical world. Enlightenment has been the reason for reclaiming spirit by denying the body, transcending form by leaving it. Thus, individual beings have become enlightened in the sense that they have fully realized their spiritual nature, but they have not fully integrated that enlightenment into their form. When they have eventually left their bodies, the world remained largely untransformed. These masters have supported and preserved the intuitive principle in our world and have paved the way for us to take the next step, the integration of feminine and masculine, spirit and form, and the subsequent transformation of our world. Those of us who choose to be spiritual seekers and transformers must now move into the world with the same degree of commitment to our spiritual selves as we would have if we renounced the world. This path is much more difficult. We are now challenged to surrender to the universe, to follow its guidance and to do so while having deep, passionate relationships, dealing with money, business, family, creative projects, and so many other, worldly, things. Rather than avoiding our attachments to the world, the time has come to acknowledge and work with them. We must move into the challenging situation, move into, recognize, and own all the feelings and attachment, and learn to embrace the full range of our experience. Meditation. Relax, close your eyes, and take a few deep breaths. With each breath, drop more deeply into a quiet place inside yourself. From this place of calm, start to see a new image of yourself in the world. Your focus is on the universe and you follow its guidance. You trust yourself. You feel strong and courageous. You carry a sense of knowingness with you into the world. Because of this trust and focus within yourself, what you create on the outside is beautiful. Your world is nourishing to you and others. You are having deep, passionate relationships, and are dealing with people, money, your career, your body, and everything else around you. You are able to be in the world and enjoy all worldly things, yet keep your commitment to the universe within yourself. This commitment is reflected in the light and power you feel. Part 2. Living the Principles. Chapter 11 Trusting Intuition. Most of us have been taught from childhood not to trust our feelings, not to express ourselves truthfully and honestly, not to recognize that at the core of our being lies a loving, powerful, and creative nature. We learn easily to try to accommodate those around us, to follow certain rules of behavior, to suppress our spontaneous impulses, and to do what is expected of us. Even if we rebel against this, we are trapped in our rebellion, doing the opposite of what we've been told in a knee-jerk reaction against authority. Very seldom do we receive any support for trusting ourselves, listening to our own sense of inner truth, and expressing ourselves in a direct and honest way. When we consistently suppress and distrust our intuitive knowingness, looking instead for authority, validation, and approval from others, we give our personal power away. This leads to feelings of helplessness, emptiness, a sense of being a victim, and eventually to anger and rage, and, if these feelings are also suppressed, to depression and deadness. We may simply succumb to these feelings, and lead a life of quiet numbness. We may overcompensate for our feelings of powerlessness by attempting to control and manipulate other people and our environment. Or we may eventually burst forth with uncontrolled rage that is highly exaggerated and distorted by its long suppression. None of these are very positive alternatives. The true solution is to re-educate ourselves to listen to and trust the inner truths that come to us through our intuitive feelings. Following our inner guidance may feel risky and frightening at first, because we are no longer playing it safe, doing what we should do, pleasing others, following rules, or deferring to outside authority. To live this way is to risk losing everything that we have held onto for reasons of external, false, security, 
but we will gain integrity, wholeness, true power, creativity, and the real security of knowing that we are in alignment with the power of the universe. In suggesting that our intuition needs to be the guiding force in our lives, I am not attempting to disregard or eliminate the rational mind. The intellect is a very powerful tool, best used to support and give expression to our intuitive wisdom, rather than as we often use it, to suppress our intuition. Most of us have programmed our intellect to doubt our intuition. When an intuitive feeling arises, our rational minds immediately say, I don't think that will work, nobody else is doing it that way, or, what a foolish idea, and the intuition is disregarded. As we move into the new world, it is time to re-educate our intellect to recognize the intuition as a valid source of information and guidance. We must train our intellect to listen to and express the intuitive voice. The intellect is by nature very disciplined and this discipline can help us to ask for and receive the direction of the intuitive self. What does it mean to trust your intuition? How do you do it? It means tuning into your gut feelings, your deepest inner sense of personal truth, in any given situation, and acting on these feelings, moment by moment. Sometimes these, gut messages, may tell you to do something unexpected or inconsistent with your previous plans, they may require that you trust a hunch that seems illogical, you may feel more emotionally vulnerable than you are used to feeling, you may express thoughts, feelings, or opinions foreign to your usual beliefs, you may follow a dream or fantasy, or take some degree of financial risk to do something that feels important to you. At first you may fear that trusting your intuition will lead you to do things that seem somewhat hurtful or irresponsible to others. For example, you may hesitate to break a date, even though you need time for yourself, because you fear hurting your date's feelings. i found that when I really listen to and trust my inner voice, in the long run, everyone around me benefits as much as I do. People may sometimes be temporarily disappointed, irritated, or a bit shaken up as you change your old patterns of relating to yourself and others. But this is usually because as you change, the people around you are automatically pushed to change as well. If you trust, you will see that the changes are also for their highest good. If you do break that date, your friend may end up having a wonderful time doing something else. If they don't want to change, they may move away from you, at least for a while, therefore, you must be willing to let go of the forms of relationship you have with people. If there is a deep connection between you, chances are good that you will be close again in the future. Meanwhile, everyone needs to grow in their own way and their own time. As you continue to follow your path, you will increasingly attract people who like you as you are and relate to you in a way that feels honest, supportive, and appreciative. Practicing a new way of living learning to trust your intuition is an art form, and like all other art forms, it takes practice to perfect. You don't learn to do it overnight. You have to be willing to make mistakes, to try something and fail, then try something different the next time, and sometimes, perhaps, even embarrass yourself or feel foolish. Your intuition is always correct, but it takes time to learn to hear it correctly. If you are willing to risk acting on what you believe to be true, and risk making mistakes, you will learn very fast by paying attention to what works and what doesn't. If you hold back out of fear of being wrong, learning to trust your intuition could take a lifetime. It can be hard to distinguish the voice of our intuition from the many other selves that speak to us, from within, the different parts of ourselves that have their own idea of what's best for us. People frequently ask me how to differentiate the voice or energy of intuition from all the others. Unfortunately, there's no simple, surefire way at first. Most of us are in touch with our intuition whether we know it or not, but we're actually in the habit of doubting or contradicting it so automatically that we don't even know it has spoken. The first step in learning is to pay more attention to what you feel inside, to the inner dialogue that goes on within you. For example, you might feel, I'd like to give Jim a call. Immediately, a rational, doubting voice inside says, why call him at this time of day? He probably won't be home, and you automatically ignore your original impulse to call. 
If you had called, you might have found him at home, and discovered he had some important information for you. Another example, you might get a feeling in the middle of the day that says, I'm tired, I'd like to take a rest. You immediately think, I can't rest now, I have a lot of work to do. So you drink some coffee to get yourself going and work the rest of the day. By the end of the day you feel tired, drained, and irritable, whereas if you had trusted your initial feeling, you might have rested for half an hour and continued about your tasks, refreshed and efficient, finishing your day in a state of balance. As you become aware of this subtle inner dialogue between your intuition and your other inner voices, it's very important not to put yourself down or diminish this experience. Try to remain a somewhat objective observer. Notice what happens when you follow your intuitive feelings. The result is usually increased energy and power, and a sense of things flowing. Now, notice what happens when you doubt, suppress, or act against your feelings. Usually, you will observe decreased energy, you may feel somewhat disempowered or depressed. You may even experience emotional or physical pain. Whether or not you act on your intuitive feelings, you'll be learning something, so try not to condemn yourself when you don't follow your intuition, thus adding insult to injury. Remember, it takes time to learn new habits, the old ways are deeply ingrained. I've been working intensively on my own re-education for many years, and while the results I'm enjoying are wonderful, there are still times when I don't yet have the courage or awareness to be able to trust myself completely and do exactly what I feel. I'm learning to be patient and compassionate with myself as I gain the courage to be true to myself. Suppose you are trying to decide whether to change jobs. You might have a conservative self that feels it would be safest to stay where you are, an adventurous self that is eager to do something different, a self that is concerned about what other people will think, and so on. One way to handle this is to listen to each of these voices and write down what each has to say, perhaps using a different color pen for each one. Then, just let yourself sit with all the conflicting viewpoints for a while without trying to resolve them or make a decision. Eventually, you will start to get an intuitive sense of what your next step needs to be. As you get to know the different selves within you, you will discover that your intuitive self has an energy or a feeling that is different from the other voices. In time, you will learn to recognize it quite easily. One important step in learning to hear and follow your intuition is simply to practice checking in regularly. At least twice a day, and much more often, if possible, once an hour is great, take a moment or two, or longer, if you can, to relax and listen to your gut feelings. Cultivate this habit of talking to your intuitive self. Ask for help and guidance when you need it and practice listening for answers that may come in many forms, words, images, feelings, or even through being led to some external source such as a book, a friend, or a teacher who will tell you just what you need to know. Your body is a tremendous helper in learning to follow your inner voice. Whenever you feel your body is in pain or discomfort, it is usually an indication that you have ignored your feelings. Use it as a signal to tune in and ask what you need to be aware of. As you learn to live from your intuition, you give up making decisions with your head. You act moment by moment on what you feel and allow things to unfold as you go. In this way, you are led in the direction that is right for you, and decisions are made easily and naturally. If possible, try not to make big decisions concerning future events until you are clear about what you want. Focus on following the energy in the moment and you'll find that it will all be handled in its own time and way. When you must make a decision related to something in the future, follow your gut feeling about it at the time the decision needs to be made. Remember, too, that although I sometimes speak of following your inner intuitive voice, most people do not literally experience it as a voice. Often it's more like a simple feeling, an energy, a sense of, I want to do this, or, I don't want to do that. Don't make it into a big deal, a mysterious mystical event, a voice from on high. It's a simple, natural human experience that we have lost touch with and need to reclaim. The main sign that you are following your intuition in your life is increased aliveness. 
It feels like more life energy is flowing through your body. Sometimes it may even feel a little overwhelming, like more energy than your body can handle. You may even have the experience of feeling tired from too much energy coming through you. You won't bring through more energy than you can deal with, but it may stretch you a little. Your body's expanding its capacity to channel the universal energy. Relax into it and rest when you need to. Do things that help you stay grounded, such as physical exercise, being in nature, emotional self-nurturing, and eating healthy, substantial foods. Soon, you'll feel more balanced and you'll even begin to enjoy the increasing intensity. At first you may find that the more you act on your intuition, the more things in your life seem to be falling apart, you might lose your job, a relationship, certain friends, or your car might even stop working. You're actually changing rapidly and shedding the things in your life that no longer fit. As long as you refuse to let go of them, they imprisoned you. As you continue on this new path, following the energy moment by moment as best you can, you will see new forms begin to be created in your life, new relationships, new work, a new home, a new form of creative expression, or whatever. It will happen easily and effortlessly. Things will just fall into place, and doors will open in a seemingly miraculous way. You may have times when you will just go along, doing what you have energy to do, and not doing what you don't have energy to do, having a wonderful time, and you will, literally, be able to watch the universe creating through you. You're starting to experience the joy of being a creative channel. Specific Examples Here are a few examples from my life, and the lives of my friends and clients, of the types of situations you might be confronted with in following your intuition. Notice that the words in parentheses are the thoughts and feelings that might have held you back or stopped you from trusting your intuition in the past. Leaving a party or meeting because you realize you really don't want to be there, even though you're afraid of what others might think or you don't want to miss something good. Telling someone that you are attracted to him, or that you would like to get to know him, or that you love him, or whatever it is that you're feeling, because it feels good to be open and tell the truth, even though you're afraid of being rejected, and it makes you feel very vulnerable, and one part of you says, you're just not supposed to do that. Deciding not to write your thesis because you really don't feel very interested in it, every time you think about it, it feels like a terrible chore, even though you spent five years working toward it, and your parents will be upset if you don't get your degree, you'd really like to have the prestige, and you think you could get a better job with it. Taking singing lessons, music lessons, a dance class, or whatever interests you, because you have a fantasy that you would love to be able to sing, play an instrument, or dance, even though you don't think you have any talent, you're too old to learn now, or you might look foolish. Not going to work one day because you feel like you want a quiet day to yourself to hang around home, lie in the sun, take a walk, or even just lie in bed, even though you always go to work and think it's terribly irresponsible not to if you're not sick, or you're afraid you might lose your job, or you think it's silly or frivolous. Quitting your job because you hate it and you realize that you don't really need to do something that you don't like, even though you're not really sure that what you're going to do next and you'll only have enough money to last you for a few months, and you feel scared about not having the security of a regular income. Not doing a favor for someone who's asked you to because you really don't want to and you know you'd feel resentful if you did, even though you're afraid you're selfish, or you might lose a friend or antagonize a coworker. Spending a little money on something special for yourself or someone else, on impulse, just because it makes you feel good, even though you're normally very frugal, and you really feel maybe you can't afford it. Telling someone your opinion about something because you're tired of pretending to agree with others, even though you normally wouldn't dare express yourself that way. Telling your family that you're not cooking dinner because you just don't feel like it, even though you're afraid you're being a bad wife and mother and they all might find out they don't need you anymore and your whole identity will be shot. Not making a decision about something because you're not sure yet what you really feel about it, even though it makes you feel uncomfortable and off-balance to be in a state of indecisiveness. Starting your own business because you have a strong feeling inside that you can do it, even though you've never done anything like that before. Well, you've got the idea. 
Trusting your intuition means tuning in as deeply as you can to the energy you feel, following that energy moment to moment, trusting that it will lead you where you want to go and bring you everything you desire. It means being yourself, being real and authentic in your communications, being willing to try new things because they feel right, and doing what turns you on. Highly Intuitive People Many people are already highly developed intuitively. Some are very much in touch with their intuition, but are afraid to act on it in the world. Often, these people will follow their intuitive promptings in one specific area of their lives, but not in others. Many artists, musicians, performers, and other highly creative people fall into this category. They strongly trust and spontaneously act on their intuition within the bounds of their art form, thus, they are extremely creative and often very productive, but they don't have the same degree of self-trust and willingness to back their feelings with action in other areas of their lives, particularly in their relationships and in matters of business and money. Thus, we have the classic case of the artistic type who is chaotic and unbalanced emotional ly, and or inept or even exploited financially. A classic example of this problem was seen in the movie Lady Sings the Blues, based on the life of the great singer Billie Holiday. In one scene, she is traveling with her show on a grueling tour of the country. She is feeling exhausted and depleted and yearns to go home to see her husband and to rest. She resolves to cancel her tour and follow her heart. However, her business managers succeed in convincing her that this move would ruin her career, that she must continue on the road. Shortly after giving in to their arguments, she begins to indulge heavily in drugs. From that point on, her life takes a downward and tragic course. Naturally, one such incident does not ruin an entire life, but this movie provides a graphic illustration of the way many artists and performers give away their authority to other influences around them and suffer the resulting inner conflict, pain, and loss of power. In order to come into balance, these people must learn to trust their intuition and assert themselves in all areas of their lives. Many psychics also experience this problem. They are very open, receptive, and intuitive, and do not block these qualities as many of us have done. They may even give their intuition free reign in their work or under certain conditions. Once again, they may not fully trust and back their intuition in every moment of their lives, especially in the area of personal relationships. They may be too wide open to other people's energies and often do not know how to stay connected to their own individual feelings and needs, how to assert themselves, and how to set boundaries. From my experience, these highly sensitive people often have problems with their bodies, either weight problems or chronic illness. These problems are healed when they learn to balance their receptive, intuitive nature, feminine energy, with an equally developed willingness to act on their feelings and assert themselves in personal relationships, masculine energy. Many spiritual seekers who have spent a good deal of time meditating, becoming very sensitive and attuned to their energy, also have problems of imbalance. The seeker has a strong mental image of what it is to be spiritual, loving, open, and centered. He or she wants to act out this model at all times and thus is afraid to act spontaneously or express feelings honestly for fear that what comes out may be harsh, rude, angry, selfish, or unloving. Since we are human, as we risk expressing ourselves more freely and honestly, some of what comes out will be unpolished, distorted, foolish, or thoughtless. As we learn to act on our inner feelings, all the ways in which we've blocked ourselves in the past are cleared out, and in that process, a lot of old stuff comes to the surface and is released. Many old beliefs and emotional patterns are brought to light and healed. In this process, we have to be willing to face and reveal our unconsciousness. By the time we can see it, it's already changing anyway. If we pretend to be more together than we really are, we will miss the opportunity to heal ourselves. I have found this to be a very vulnerable and out of control feeling. I can't worry too much about how I'm presenting myself or how I look to others or whether I'm doing the right thing. I just have to be myself as I am now, 
as best I can, accepting the mixture of enlightened awareness and human limitation that is what I am right now. It isn't necessary to be perfect to be a channel for the universe. You just have to be real, be yourself. The more authentic, honest, and spontaneous you are, the more freely the creative force can flow through you. As it does so, it cleans out the remnants of old blockages. What comes out may sometimes be unpleasant or uncomfortable, but the energy moving through will feel great. The more you do this, the clearer your channel gets, so that what comes through is an increasingly perfect expression of the universe. Remember, too, that some of our spiritual models reflect our good ideas more than they reveal an accurate picture of enlightenment. The picture that many people have of wanting to be mellow, positive, and loving all the time is really an expression of their need to feel in control, good, and right. The universe has many colors, moods, speeds, styles, and direction, furthermore, they are all constantly changing. Only by letting go of some of our control and risking moving fearlessly with this flow will we get to experience the ecstasy of being a true channel. Exercise 1. Write down all the reasons you can think of for not trusting and following your intuition. Include on the list any fears you have about what might happen to you if you trust your intuition and act on it all the time. 2. Review the meditation at the end of the third chapter, the chapter on intuition, see page 42. 3. At least twice a day, more often if you can remember, take a minute to relax, close your eyes, and check in with your gut feeling to see if you are doing what feels right or if there's anything you need to be aware of. 4. For one day, or one week, assume that your intuitive feelings about things are always 100% right and act as if that is so. Chapter 12 Feelings One of the most common problems I encounter in my work is that so many people are out of touch with their feelings. When we have suppressed and closed off our feelings, we cannot contact the universe within us, we cannot hear our intuitive voice, and we certainly can't enjoy being alive. It seems that many people did not get enough real emotional support when they were growing up. Our parents didn't know how to support their own feelings, much less ours. Perhaps they were too overwhelmed with the difficulties and responsibilities in their lives to be able to give us the emotional response and care we needed. Whatever the causes, if we don't feel anyone is there to listen to us and care about our feelings, or if we get a negative response when we do express ourselves, we soon learn to suppress our emotions. When we bottle up our feelings, we close off the life energy flowing through our bodies. The energy of these unfelt, unexpressed feelings remains blocked in our bodies, causing emotional and physical discomfort and eventually illness and disease. We become numb and somewhat deadened. In every workshop I give, I encounter people who have been repressing their feelings throughout their lives. Many people are afraid to feel their so-called negative emotions, sadness, hurt, anger, fear, despair. They are afraid that if they open up to experiencing these feelings, the emotions will be overwhelming. They are terrified that if they get into the experience, they'll remain stuck forever. In fact, the opposite is true. When you are willing to fully experience a particular feeling, the blocked energy releases quickly and the feeling dissolves. When counseling someone who has blocked emotion, I support them in moving into the feeling and allowing it to overwhelm them. Once they've felt it completely and expressed it, it usually dissipates within a few minutes. It's amazing to watch people who have suppressed a painful feeling for 30, 40, or 50 years release it within a few minutes and experience peace in its place. It may be important to have the support of a therapist or support group during this process. Once you have experienced and released blocked emotion from the past, a greater flow of energy and vitality will enrich your life. It is important to learn to be in touch with your feelings as they arise, in this way, they can continue to move through and your channel will remain clear. Emotions are cyclical in nature and, like the weather, they are constantly changing. In the course of an hour, a day, or a week we may move through a wide range of feelings. If we understand this, 
we can learn to enjoy all our feelings and simply allow them to keep changing. But when we are afraid of certain feelings, like sadness or anger, we put on our emotional brakes when we start to feel them. We don't want to feel it completely, so we get stuck halfway into it and never get through it. Often, people come to my workshops who want to learn how to think positively so they won't feel so stuck in their negative feelings. They are surprised when I urge them to feel more of their negative feelings, not less. It's only by loving and accepting all parts of ourselves that we can be free and fulfilled. We tend to think of certain feelings as painful and therefore wish to avoid them. The experience of pain, however, is actually resistance to a sensation. Pain is a mechanism in our physical body that helps us avoid physical harm or notifies us that a part of us has been injured and needs care. If you touch a hot stove, you will feel pain, this is resistance to the sensation of heat that you are experiencing. It causes you to pull your hand away and thus avoid damaging your body. If you do touch something hot for too long and burn yourself, the subsequent pain lets you know that your body needs healing. So, on the physical level, pain is a useful mechanism in that it lets us know that we are in danger. However, if a sensation isn't really dangerous, you can relax into it and the pain will diminish and dissolve. For example, if you stretch a muscle farther than usual, it will at first feel painful, but as you continue to relax gently and steadily into the stretched position, the pain will be released. In childbirth, if a woman resists the intense sensation she is experiencing, she will have great pain. The more she is able to relax into the sensation, the less painful it will be. On the emotional level, it is our resistance to a feeling that causes us pain. If, because we are afraid of a certain feeling, we suppress it, we will experience emotional pain. If we allow ourselves to feel it and accept it fully, it becomes an intense sensation, though not a painful one. There are no such things as negative or positive feelings, we make them negative or positive by our rejection or acceptance of them. To me, all feelings are part of the wonderful, ever-changing sensation of being alive. If we love all the different feelings we experience, they become so many rainbow colors of life. Here are some emotions that people seem to be most afraid of, with a suggestion of one way you might handle them, fear, it's important to acknowledge and accept your fears. If you accept yourself for feeling afraid, and don't try too hard to push past your fears, you will start to feel more secure, and the fear will lessen. Take risks when you feel ready to do so, but don't force yourself to do things you aren't ready for yet. Sadness, sadness is related to the opening of your heart. If you allow yourself to feel sad, especially if you can cry, you will find that your heart opens further and you can feel more love. If possible, reach out for comfort and support from someone who accepts you and your sadness and can just be with you. Grief, this is an intense form of sadness, related to the death or ending of something. It is our way of releasing the old so that we can be open to the new. It is very important to allow yourself to grieve fully and not to cut this process short. Grief comes in waves, at first close together, then gradually, further apart. Grief can sometimes last a long time, or recur periodically for a very long time. It's necessary to accept it and give yourself as much support as you need to get through it, whenever it comes up. Hurt, hurt is an expression of vulnerability. We tend to mask it with defensiveness and blame so we won't have to admit how vulnerable we really feel. It's important to express feelings of hurt directly and, if possible, in a no-blaming way, in other words, I felt really hurt when you didn't ask me to go with you, as opposed to, you don't care about my feelings. How could you be so insensitive, and so on. Hopelessness this can be the result of not trusting ourselves, honoring our feelings and needs, nor taking proper care of ourselves. We may need to be more true to ourselves and more assertive. Hopelessness can also be a stage we go through when we are letting go of our old patterns of control and learning to surrender to our higher power. Anger, 
When we disown our true power and allow other people to have undue power over us, we become angry. Usually we suppress this anger and go numb. As we start to get back in touch with our power, the first thing we feel is the stored up anger. So, for many people who are growing more conscious, it's a very positive sign when they begin to get in touch with their anger. It means they are reclaiming their power. If you have not allowed yourself to get angry much in your life, you will start to set up situations and people that trigger your anger. Don't focus too much on the external problem when this happens, just allow yourself to feel the anger and recognize that it is your power. Visualize a volcano going off inside of you and filling you with power and energy. Often people are very frightened of their anger, they fear it will cause them to do something harmful. If you have this fear, see if you can create a safe situation where you can allow yourself to feel it fully and express it, either alone, or with a therapist or support group. Allow yourself to rant and rave, kick and scream, throw a temper tantrum, throw or hit pillows, whatever you feel like doing. Once you've done this in a safe environment, you may need to do it regularly, you will no longer be so afraid of doing something destructive and you will be able to handle the situations in your life more effectively. If you are a person who has felt and expressed a lot of anger in your life, you need to look for the hurt that is underneath it and express that. You are probably using anger as a defense mechanism to avoid being vulnerable. An important key in transforming anger into an acceptance of your power is learning to assert yourself. Learn to ask for what you want and do what you want to do without being unduly influenced by other people. When you stop giving your power away to other people, you won't feel angry anymore. Acceptance of your feelings is directly related to becoming a creative channel. If you don't allow your feelings to flow, your channel will be blocked. If you've stored up a lot of emotions, you have a lot of blocked energy or erupting emotions inside of you which don't allow you to hear the more subtle voice of your intuition. Often people need help in experiencing and releasing old emotional blocks and learning to live in a more feeling way. If you believe you need some help with this, find a good counselor, therapist, or support group. In seeking a therapist, ask people you know for referrals and don't hesitate to interview several until you find one that you like. Try to find one who seems to be in touch with his or her own feelings, relates to you in a real and honest way, and supports you in experiencing and expressing your own feelings, and in trusting yourself. Whether you seek professional help or not, make a practice of asking yourself frequently throughout the day how you are feeling. Try to learn to distinguish between what you are thinking and how you are feeling, many people have difficulty with this. As much as possible, accept and enjoy your feelings, and you will find that they open the door to a rich, full, and passionate life. Exercise When you wake up in the morning, close your eyes and put your attention in the middle of your body, your heart, your solar plexus, and your abdomen. Ask yourself how you are feeling emotionally right now. Try to distinguish your feelings from the thoughts you are having in your head. Are you feeling peaceful, excited, anxious, sad, angry, joyful, frustrated, guilty, loving, lonely, fulfilled, serious, playful? If there seems to be an anxious or upset feeling inside of you, go into that feeling and give it a voice. Ask it to talk to you and tell you what it's feeling. Make an effort to hear it and listen to its point of view. Be sympathetic, loving, and supportive toward your feelings. Ask what you can do to take care of yourself at this time. Repeat this exercise before you go to sleep at night, and at any other time during the day that feels appropriate. Chapter 13. Balancing Being and Doing. As channels for the universe, we must have available a full range of expression and emotion. If the higher power tells us to leap, we must be able to leap without stopping to ask questions. If it tells us to wait, we must be able to relax and enjoy a space of non-activity until the next message comes. We will always be pushed by our inner guidance to explore aspects of ourselves that are less developed, to express and experience ourselves in new ways. If we ignore these inner impulses, 
we will be forced by external life circumstances to explore the opposite polarities from the ones we are most comfortable with. One way or another, our higher self makes sure that we get the message of what we have to do. At times we may swing from one polarity to the other until we come into balance. You can expect that your intuition will lead you in directions that are new and different for you. If you are comfortable in one type of personality or pattern, you will probably be asked to start expressing the opposite. It's good to know this, especially when you're in the process of learning to hear your inner guidance. A good rule might be to expect the unexpected. One of the most important sets of polarities that we need to develop and balance are the energies of being and doing. Most of us are more identified with one of these energies, and disown the other. The two types could be called the doers and the beers. They roughly correspond to type A and type B personalities in common psychological terminology. The doers are people who are primarily action-oriented. They know how to get things done, and they usually aren't afraid to put themselves out there and take risks in expressing themselves or trying new things. Basically, they are good at expressing their outgoing energy. They have trouble receiving. They don't like feeling vulnerable. The most difficult thing for them is doing nothing, not being engaged in some type of constructive activity. Unstructured time makes them uncomfortable and they usually fill it up with lots of activity. They tend to be driven and have a hard time really relaxing. Their male, active energy is more developed, and they may be somewhat uncomfortable with their female, receptive side. Beers are mainly oriented toward inner attunement. They know how to relax and take it easy. They enjoy the subtle pleasure of life and often know how to nurture themselves and others, and how to play. They are usually flexible, and are happy to hang out with unstructured time. They may have trouble with action. They fear putting themselves out in new or unusual ways and tend to hold back a lot. They aren't very assertive and sometimes have trouble expressing feelings or opinions. They worry about what others will think of them. They may be uncomfortable in the world and lack the confidence to deal with people, business, money, and so on. Their female, receptive energy is more developed and they may be uncomfortable or distrustful of their male, outgoing side. If you are primarily a doer, your intuition will almost surely lead you in the direction of doing less. Your feelings will tell you to stop, to relax and take a day off, or a week, or six months, to spend more time alone with yourself, to spend time in nature, to spend time with no plan and no list, and just practice following the energy as you feel it. If you consistently ignore these inner messages to slow down, you may develop a minor or major illness. This may be the way the universe forces you to become more balanced. The hardest thing for a doer is getting no message at all, having to hang out and wait and do nothing until further guidance comes. I am primarily a doer, a list maker, a very active person, and one of the hardest things for me has been when the universe has forced me to do nothing. Yet, I find that those times are the most powerful and inspirational of all because that's when I can really stop long enough to feel my spirit. In fact, I finally realized and had to admit that I kept busy all my life in order to avoid feeling that power. I was afraid of empty time and space because it was actually so full of the universal force. If you are more comfortable with being you will undoubtedly be pushed by your inner self into more action, more expression, more risk-taking in the world. The key for you is to follow your impulses and to try doing things you wouldn't normally do on impulse. You don't have to know why you're doing something or see any particular result from it at first. It's important to simply practice acting spontaneously on your feelings, especially when it comes to dealing with people, expressing your creative energy in the world, making money, or anything else you might normally avoid. Don't push yourself harder or farther than you are ready to go. It's very important to respect your own boundaries and rhythms for growing. Make sure the voice isn't coming from your inner authoritarian self, saying, you should put yourself out in this way. If it's a should, it's seldom the voice of the universe. 
Rather, follow the feelings you have that guide you to practice expressing yourself and building your confidence in a supportive way. Meditation. Get comfortable and close your eyes. Take a few deep breaths and each time you exhale, relax your body and mind into a deep, quiet level of consciousness. Imagine yourself as a very balanced person. You are able to relax, play, and nurture yourself frequently, and you enjoy having time and space in your life when there is nothing special you have to do. Yet you act on your feelings and impulses spontaneously, express yourself strongly and directly, and risk trying new things whenever you are inspired to do so. You live in the full range of being and doing, so you can follow your inner guidance in whatever direction it leads you. Exercise If you are primarily a doer, spend one day consciously doing as little as possible. Take note of how you feel and what happens. If you are better at being than doing, take a day to practice acting on any impulse or inspiration you have, without expecting any particular results. Try several new and unusual things, especially things that involve making contact with people or putting yourself out in the world in new ways. Notice how you are feeling before, during, and after you do this.